on the count of 5 4 3 2 1 hello and welcome to productlessons.com a youtube channel where we talk to product leaders from all over the world and learn from them how they build and manage world class software products you may subscribe to the channel to be notified for future episodes and i can assure you that there is an exciting lineup of product leaders in the days to come and if you want uh, audio only format which has been um, the format that i began my podcast uh, several years ago you can still do that uh, i strip out the audio from the the youtube uh, channel and upload it on soundcloud the link is in the description below so uh, yeah with that let me talk about uh, the guest today and why i'm so thrilled and excited to have him um, I, w- I was just talking to him uh, before this interview. I told him that um, I must have interviewed over 150 guests on my podcast, uh, but of them, I don't think I waited with such high anticipation for anyone else, uh, because my admiration for him has grown in the last uh, few months, in, in, especially in the SaaS space. And uh, there's no exaggeration there. And this happened because I read his book, um, his his bestseller book, Product Led Growth, and the book is a treatise, not just on product led growth but on um, saas business in general and uh, it was a perfect problem solution fit for me because i was looking for a resource like that and the book uh, does not waste any words every chapter every page is full of high value insights and uh, i had many aha moments while reading the book uh, also it's it's written uh, very uh, humorously as well in, in places like it says uh, to stop a motorbike you can use the front back or engine <laughs> brake <laughs> or just drive into a nearby lake so uh, quite funny at that so I, I can shout at the top of a mountain and say that this is a very valuable book buy the book i am reading the kindle version now and i'm going to get the physical uh, copy to don my shelf uh, so with that let's join hands uh, to invite uh, vesh bus best selling author of product led growth and the founder of product led community to the show uh, nice. hi vesh <laughs> welcome to product how are you doing today I'm doing great, thanks. Thanks so much for inviting me on the show. This is going to be a great chat. Yeah, I have been I have been behind you for a while. I know you are a, a busy guy, as I mentioned before. Um, and uh, the flavor of the season is uh, product-led growth. Uh, I, I can't just stop uh, hearing about it from all quarters. But before we jump into the topic, I'm very, very curious to know about your career uh, trajectory. As I m- mentioned, you, you suddenly burst uh, uh, in, in the scene from nowhere. And in the last six months, I've just heard about you. So how, what, tell us a bit about your career trajectory and the motivations behind uh, doing what you're doing now. Yeah, so I remember I'd always ask people in product, like, how did he get in product? And I remember the first um, VP of product asked that question. He's like, I, I just fell into this world. And I find it funny, like thinking back to it, like five years later, because I'm like, I feel exactly the same. I just fell into this world of product. And for me, it really started with, I was actually in marketing and demand gen. And so that was my background. I was focused solely on that. Uh, My like core objective within any startup I was working at was really just how can I generate a lot of high quality leads to feed our sales team? That was my job. And so we were doing it in a very traditional way. And so we were creating a bunch of contents, putting it behind lead forms, directing a bunch of traffic to it, and then really sending those people uh, emails and hoping that they're going to one day uh, convert as a demo request and then eventually a customer. And so something about that way of marketing just didn't quite sit well with me because I would look at the way I bought products And it traditionally, unless I really, really, really wanted that product, I wouldn't actually go through that lengthy sales process myself. I really loved the products where I could actually sign up, see for myself what it was all about. And if it solved my problem, I had no problem actually paying for that product. And so whenever we launched a freemium product at Vidyard, uh, that went from about like zero to 100,000 users, super quick, um, I got to see from the inside just how you could use your product as a customer acquisition model. And so um, from that moment, it's really helped me understand that your product, it isn't just something you sell. 
your product is how you serve others. And so from that moment, I've been really doubling down on how can you use your product as a customer acquisition model and really a growth engine for your business. And so um, that's the, the short story of how I really fell into this world of product-led growth. And nothing really excites me more than just seeing others really use their product as this growth engine for your product that it is. Uh, the, the quotable quote that uh, goes on my Twitter uh, attributing to Wes is, I loved it, a product is not something you sell, but it's something you serve others. And that is that is most times we all forget, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thanks for sharing your motivations. Um, so yeah, let's let's dig in then. I know you have, you must be by now tired, but uh, talking about product-led growth, but I can tell you for sure that there is an entire uh, world out there who still are waking up to uh, this concept. For so sure. at, at the risk, risk of repeating yourself uh, uh, ad infinitum, what is product-led growth and uh, how is it different from the older ways of uh, building products? Yeah, so I guess before I go through the, the definition of like what I would consider product-led growth, I think it's helpful if we just take a step back and look at um, sales-led businesses and like that whole traditional process because in a sales-led business, it's really, as the, the name connotates, sales-led. And you can't close a deal unless you actually talk to someone and go through that sales process to um, see if the product's a good fit. Usually that's in some sort of demo format. And then when you become a customer, that's usually when onboarding starts. And so it's a really kind of different customer acquisition process. Whereas uh, when you're product led, typically that journey will start with, you know, you learn about this company, you might read a bit about them, you might even check out the pricing page, and then you actually go into the product, see and evaluate it for yourself if it's gonna be a good fit. So if we just look at that contrast between one and the other, sales led companies, they're focused on telling you, here's the value of our product. Here's how this can help you. And then the product led way of selling is really just here, see for yourself. We wanna show you the value of your product. And so that's really when I was uh, kind of relating to the other story of how I got into product led growth, that's what fascinated me about it. I saw, you know, one's just about telling, one's about showing. And from a risk perspective, this is where it gets really interesting because in a sales led company, when we're just telling people like, here's how valuable this product's gonna be for you. And we can have the best intentions, um, not over promise or anything else like that. I'm not saying it's slimy sales whatsoever, but in that scenario, someone's gonna be thinking in the back of their head, can this product actually deliver on its promise? That's what they're thinking. And because they still have that question in the back of their head, it's risky. And so the whole product led notion is really just like, let's get people in there, let's show them the value. And by the time they experience that value on their own, they don't have to answer that question. We've answered it for them. And because of that, um, the whole risk profile of buying that product is significantly easier to justify because we know for a fact, uh, because we've seen it ourselves that this is gonna help us. So. Um, my whole definition of product-led growth is really just around using your product as the main acquisition, activation, and even retention uh, channel for your business. And so I think if you were to sum up product-led growth into one sentence, um, it would be this, like end user success will eventually become your success because you really can't build a successful product-led business if you don't understand how can we make our end users successful? Um, if you think of even just a product you signed up for recently, um, if it didn't deliver on its promise, you probably didn't come back to that product a second time. And so it's a, it's a high bar <laughs> for a lot of product-led companies um, to meet and help their users um, have a good reason to come back. And that really comes down to, are we delivering on our promise or not? Got it. Uh, thank you. So uh, the, the very common question that follows this argument is, uh, Great, uh, I understand why uh, acquisition, activation, and retention should, uh, product should become the source of all of that. And um, most prominently for acquisition, 
but is product led growth uh, more suitable for uh, say consumer or sme products or do you also see it relevant for enterprise products which could be more expensive and might need a lot of uh, sales um, um, effort yeah so this whole conversation around sales and product led growth is really fascinating and i named my book i thought this is going to be controversial but the subtitle for it is how to build a product that sells itself and a lot of people will start thinking well does that mean we don't actually need sales and here's the the caveat on this if someone goes into your product they experience the value of the product and they get to a point where they have that aha moment they understand it uh, the product has actually done the majority of quote unquote selling. And so that's really powerful. Does that mean they're going to be closing that million dollar contract? Sure. No, not quite. And so what we're really looking at is an evolution of sales. What really goes on in a salesperson's job in a product led business is really fascinating because it sometimes has some resemblance to sales led companies, but a lot of times it's completely different. I've seen in a bunch of product led companies where it sometimes offers more a feedback like support. They're just trying to help people and serve them and uh, really help them build that business case to make in a larger organization. And so one thing I find very interesting when it comes to sales and product led growth is just how you're measuring success. And in a sales led company, you're typically measuring like marketing qualified leads, how many of those turn into sales qualified leads. Um, but whenever it's a product led business, there's a new metric you need to start measuring and that is product qualified leads. Yeah. And so what's really great about product qualified leads is you're looking at who is experiencing the value of our product? And then sales can then have that conversation with the people who already understand their value. And salespeople, the funny thing I hear again and again, usually they're the most resistant to product-led growth. But once they start seeing that, hey, the product can do the majority of the qualification for me, and instead of focusing on maybe those smaller SMB accounts um, that might have a really small average contract value, they're spending most of their time helping the highest value, highest contract value customers really get into the product and sell that business case to their own business. And so sales, uh, using the later stage of a product of company, they're the ones leading the charge, which is honestly hilarious because they're the most resistant at the first. So I've seen it so many times. It's, uh, it's super interesting to see how it impacts enterprise buyers. But um, at the end of the day, it's human to human. Like enterprise buyers, they want to have that same customer experience that they're experiencing on our mobile apps and everything else. They're the same buyers that we are. Uh, just because they're working at a bigger company doesn't mean they have lower standards in terms of user experience. Got it. Yeah, it's, this was another aha moment for me. But so, so what you're saying is this actually helps um, sales teams become more effective and efficient, isn't it? So they do not yeah. have is a lot of bad leads but if somebody has already invested into the product and have uh, gone deep uh, a, a lead has gone deeper into the product and has spent more time it is actually qualifying him to become a better lead for the sales to pursue isn't it yep. so so it's it's, it's 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 actually a better solution for sales so i think those people who are resisting at first their resistance is because of lack of knowledge. But I think uh, with your experience, what you're saying is that impression is changing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of sales leaders too, they never have heard of like a product of a lead and how that could work. Um, but usually when they start seeing like, hey, we could be piping um, this sort of data into Salesforce or whatever kind of CRM they're using, um, they get pretty excited because there really is just that lack of I don't understand what's actually going on in the product, but if I did, um, we could be reaching out way more targeted than we have been in the past and have way better conversations. And at the end of the day, like sales people don't want to feel spammy. They don't want to feel like they're just want to be ignored. No, they want to be helpful. And so um, tying that data into their role is very important. And that's also creating new roles like product ops and everything else around operations, which um, is huge. Got it. Got it. So as I said, uh, my questions are uh, from from your book. Um, the, so your book has 16 chapters, which are divided into three parts, designing your strategy, building your foundation, and igniting your growth engine. Um, 
So my questions will be uh, interspersed across these parts. Uh, you mentioned that in the last five years, uh, CACs have increased, customer acquisition costs have increased more than 50%, while willingness to pay is down by 30%. And we need to instill a culture of optimization. Could you explain that bit? Yeah. So part of the reason why like customer acquisition costs are skyrocketing right now is because it has never been easier to create a business. And so this sounds kind of contrary because like Hacker Noon has a bunch of reports that just go to show you can actually start a SaaS company for $0. Um, that was impossible not too long ago. And so the barrier to entry is so low, but that also means that it's becoming more expensive to grow just because the nature of it, there's so much more competition for every single category. I mean, tons of people always refer back to like the marketing technology landscape. I'm trying not to be one of those people, but um, it's actually grown 5,233% in just the last five years. So if you think of that, if you're in the MarTech space and everyone's competing for the same marketing budget, it's become 5,233% more competitive. And that's just looking at the amount of competition of other companies. Um, but your marketing channels as a result are becoming more expensive. So even if you look at Facebook in 2017, there was over 117% uh, increase in the cost of advertising in that channel. And so you just have a massive amount of companies in every single category now. Um, every category in SaaS is going to become commoditized very quickly, even more quickly than it was in the past. And so if you're not thinking about how are we going to consistently create a culture of innovation and stay at the top, then it's going to be very hard to stay in business. And so that's why I was really recommending in the book that that culture of optimization and innovation is really, um, when you look at building a moat for a business, um, that is one of the keys that you must have if you're going to sustain your business long-term. Got it. Um, the other aspect of uh, uh, product-led growth is also, I felt that at this, what stage of the product is this relevant? Um, is it also relevant at the growth stage of a product? Because that is when you are scaling, you're going to new geographies. Um, do you see that uh, playing a role at, at the scaling phase of the life cycle of the product as well? So the earlier is always easier. Mm -hmm. I've seen companies do it at each stage. And whenever it's later, it's a lot harder just because um, typically you will have if you're, let's say, a thousand person SaaS company and you have that thousand people, maybe around 500 or 400 of them are going to be sales. And that's because the way you've scaled a sales led organization in the past, it's pretty linear. If you think about it, you hire X number of salespeople, you put X quotas on them, you expect X bump in revenue. Whether you hit that or not is kind of up to the, the performance of the average salesperson, but um, that's how you'd scale it. And so there's this very interesting progression where you're seeing, okay, um, how do these product-led companies really scale? And if you are, let's say, at the, the growth stage or scale-up phase, and you do launch this, um, there's no right or wrong timing. What I would also um, really challenge people to think about is more about the market, not necessarily your company size, because I think that's a pretty bad indicator because it doesn't tell you too much about um, your audience, your market, um, and all those other things that are super important. And so in the book, um, I do go through a framework, I call it the moat framework, but there's essentially like four things I'd recommend thinking about as far as it goes to, is now the right time to be product led and really pull that plug? Um, one of them is really just around like, what is the, the market strategy you're using? But one of the, the most important ones out of that framework is really around your ocean conditions. So if you're, let's say in a red ocean, you're just harvesting demand, um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have a product-led go-to-market strategy, in my opinion, because it's just going to get more and more competitive. The customer acquisition costs are just going to go up and up. And if you're not having the most competitive go-to-market strategy in the markets, um, you are eventually going to become a very uncompetitive company <laughs> in that category. And um, that's, that's obviously not where you want to be. Whereas if you're still noticing, like we are in a blue ocean, we're creating this new demand, 
there's a lot of education that needs to go on in doing that. And so sometimes in that specific category, having sales is still a huge asset because whenever you're thinking about should we have sales or should we not or when should we add them to this process or not in a product-led organization too is just ask yourself like is sales adding friction or adding value and if you can answer like hey our sales team is still adding a ton of value even at the very beginning of the uh, let's say demo request process um, then by all means like can keep it, continue it. But if you start to say to yourself, you know, our sales team is adding a ton of friction throughout this process. Um, people already kind of know what they want when they're on the call. They just want to know the pricing. They just want to know these things and this criteria. Um, why are we building that much friction into the process? Why not just give them the product to evaluate? And if they have questions, sure, we can be there and give them an easy way for them to reach out to us. Uh, but let's not lead with that because that's adding a ton of friction. And so um, that's really what I would focus on is trying to answer that question. Uh, is this adding value or friction as it relates to sales? Um, because it's a good indicator of when you should try and focus on going product led or sales led. Got it. Uh, was the joke shared on your Twitter or somebody else's Twitter where it said, uh, please send the pricing on my email? Uh, I yes, I think it? that was uh, Dave, um, CMO at Privy. And I like reshared it because I was like, yes, this is so true. Like a lot of us will, um, you know, reach out to some sales led companies who don't put up their pricing and then they want to hop on a call to go through the pricing and go through the demo to really reinstate the value of the product. And a lot of us are, are kind of sick of it. We're just like, well, can you just show me the, the price? I want to see from the right market, even if this is even in the budget, if it's not like I just go somewhere else kind of thing. And so, yeah, it is a huge frustration for a lot of people. And um, it's good to see because one of the, the big changes, if you are ever going to be making this transition from sales at a product led is pricing. And even when I was writing the book, that was one of the pieces that caught me off guard. I, I didn't really think that pricing would have just that big of an impact on a product led go to market strategy. But when you think about it, even how you'd structure a freemium model, it's really, uh, this is where people get confused. Like they think, hey, it's just a pricing strategy. Um, it is a customer acquisition strategy too, but it's like this arranged marriage kind of deal because dependent on what you pick as your metric of how you charge by um, really helps you decide, okay, uh, how much of that are we gonna give away? So in MailChimp or ConvertKit or ActiveCampaign, like the value metric in this well-established market of marketing automation is contacts. And so they can give you a certain number of contacts, let's say 2000, and you can use that product for free. You get all access to it. It's free for that 2000 subscribers. Once you hit that limit, then you have to upgrade and get to the next level. So um, pricing is a massive, uh, huge impact on just how you set this up and also knowing um, how much should you give away for free versus what do you put behind that paywall? Got it. You, you mentioned about the value metrics. Uh, do you do you want to elaborate what what actually value metrics mean? Yeah. So it's uh, the method that you charge by. So if you uh, Patrick Campbell's favorite example of this is really um, if you're selling shoes is per pair of shoes. Um, if you're one of those other companies I mentioned like Mailchimp, it's per contact. And I'll try and think of some others on the spot. If it's Slack, like it's per user. Uh, same thing with Asana that just went public recently too, like they charge per user. Uh, so it's just the way you measure value in your product. And it does have to follow certain criteria too. You can't just like pick it out of thin air and be like, this is how we're gonna charge from now on. It does have to make sense to the person buying it because the whole goal of a value metric, in my opinion, is it, it needs to really state, okay, this is the amount of value we're gonna give you and it has to be easy for someone to understand how much am I going to get charged per month? Because if they're asking themselves that question, it's not the right value metric. They have to quickly understand five seconds or less. Am I going to be charged you know, 100 bucks or is this going to be $100,000? There's a huge difference there. Uh, and part of the reason people are going to invest their time in going through your free trial or freemium model 
is because they know, well, okay, I can afford it and I'm going to invest my time in this as well because it's not just about the money. It's also about the time it takes to set these things up. So that's a quick overview on value metrics, but it is a whole nother can of worms um, that we could go into. <laughs> Yeah, but just briefly, what, what makes for a good value metric? What are the, some uh, rule of thumb that we could apply for good value metrics? Yeah, so I mentioned one of them, which is really just, it has to be easy to understand. Uh, so subscribers, that has really been uh, really prevalent for both CRMs, uh, marketing animation. And so it's a really easy metric that scales. If you got 20,000 contacts, you know, okay, I'm gonna be charged this much if you just kind of scroll along the dial of how many subscribers you have. Um, so that's one of the, the main ones. And it also has to be easy to enforce. So that's something a lot of companies don't quite think about either is how could we really um, actually enforce this. If it's subscribers, that's fairly straightforward. Um, but sometimes you might pick a, a metric and you actually have no way of actually knowing how they're using that product. Maybe it's um, they're using it in a desktop environment, they downloaded the application, and by that point, you just don't have that data feeding back to your company. And so that part can be um, something else you really do need to make sure that you can actually enforce it. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, my next question was on uh, an interesting uh, framework that you shared, uh, the UCD framework. Maybe you could shed some light there. Yeah, absolutely. So the UCD framework is really just the foundation of product-led growth. And so I was really trying to just understand, OK, what goes into some of the most successful product-led businesses? And what I kept noticing is that um, the most successful product-led businesses get three things right. And so one of them is just understanding their customer. And this might sound like a no, duh, like of course they'd have to understand their customer. But the reason it's so important is because they understand their value. And this kind of translates back to what we were talking about a bit earlier about even just the value metrics and how do we package our value in an easy to consume way where people can quickly understand it. And so, the beauty of really understanding your product and the main job it can accomplish for your users is that from that moment, whether it's our marketing or even just our onboarding and how we get people into the product, we can accelerate their time to value because we understand, okay, this is what our ideal customer profile they want to accomplish in our product. But the thing is, if you just understand the value of your product, um, it's not worth much unless you also get equally good at communicating the perceived value of your product. And so that's another thing successful product-led companies are really, really good at is just how can we communicate this to the broader market in a way that they can understand and we can promise them or make a promise to them that it really entices them to check out the product and see for themselves. But the big difference here Probably the most important part is D of the UCD framework, because this is what separates the sales-led companies from the product-led companies in especially the customer acquisition process. And this really comes down to delivering on what you promise. So that's the last part of the UCD framework. And why I kept it last is because, well, you cannot be successful as a product-led business if you don't get really good at delivering on what you promise. And so the thing that separates the top 1% of successful product-led businesses from everyone else really comes down to this. Um, here, everyone else kind of goes like this. They perceive the value, they promise people in the market something. And then over here we have what they've experienced. But in a lot of those user experiences and user journeys, uh, there's this big nasty thing in the middle, which we call time to value. And it, it just gets in the way of this experience of a great world-class product experience because people get into the product, they're promised something, they're excited about it, uh, but they just never get to the point of experiencing the value of the product. So they churn out, they never come back to the product. Um, but the products we do come and use and love every single day, they promised us something at the beginning and they got extremely good at delivering on that value consistently and quickly when we first used it. And so that's really the kind of argument I'm pitching in the book is just, we need to get 
incredibly good at delivering on our promise at the end of the day. And hopefully it's not too oversimplified for a lot of people to follow, but um, that's truly what I believe the best product that businesses are doing is getting incredibly good at delivering on that promise fast because that speed and time to value is what is preventing many of these companies from, or many of these users from coming back a second time. Got it. Um, while, while you were sharing this, I um, thought of the role of marketing here and the role of marketing becomes all the more important because uh, even though it's a product led, uh, so you want to make it self-service for the users to test it out before they can make decisions. But even before testing it out, the messaging has to be as a wrapper uh, before it, right? So you have to entice the target audience to try your product. So you have to have a right messaging which aligns with what they want so that they are not surprised if the product turns out to be something else, isn't it? So yeah. there has to be an alignment. I think the role of marketing becomes all the more important. It would, would, would you agree to that? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, the common misconceptions, especially as it relates to onboarding too, is a lot of people think, you know, onboarding starts when people go into the product. And a lot of them, think they're right. And the fact that, okay, they signed up for the product, this is when we're going to start onboarding them and training them how to use the product. But I would argue onboarding actually starts the second they, they interact with your brands. Maybe it's even before that they're reading something on G2 or Trustpilot about your category of products and you just have a high rated product. And so they're learning about your product, they're getting that first impression and that's the perceived value I'm referring to. And so um, if that first perceived value uh, matches up with what they're experiencing in the product, you can have a very good user experience and a user that actually wants to pull out their credit card and pay you for your product because it delivered on its promise. And so um, that's one thing that I'm glad you brought out because marketing has a profound impact on just um, setting that expectation because you're not going to be successful if your marketing team is over promising and really just doing whatever it takes to get people in the door and boost their sign up numbers. Um, that's that's not going to work because people are eventually going to realize like, hey, you know, this uh, product isn't actually as good as we thought it would be. And I myself have bought lots of products like that. And I get into them, I'm like, is this it? And then I, I usually don't come back because it's just, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel honest at the end of the day. And people are susceptible to that. And that's really, um, when we think of sales at businesses, it's so easy to do that. Like anyone can tell people like, hey, the product can do this, or maybe it will do this in three months. And you know, maybe it takes three years to actually develop out that feature. So talk is cheap. Brand promises are cheap. What really differentiates the winning SaaS companies of today is actually delivering on your promise as quickly as you possibly can and showing you that, hey, we can actually deliver on our promise. Thank you. Um, in chapter 12, which is one of my favorite chapters, you said optimizing any new businesses, you need to ask three questions. Uh, what do you, where do you want to go? Second, which levers can you pull to get there? And third is, which input should we invest in? Could you just briefly uh, explain these three questions, please? Yeah, absolutely. So what was the, the first question you wanted me to go through? Uh, where do you want to go? That's the first question. Right, okay. Yeah, so the reason that I try and break it down to these three questions to ask yourself is really just because understanding where you want to go as business is key. I, I see a lot of growth teams focusing on areas that might not drive the kind of growth we want to do right now. And so understanding where you want to go is really just the key of that. But then the second part of just the levers you can pull to get there, that's really just comes down to you simple thinking around inputs versus outputs in the business. And if you think about every business, I don't care if it's SaaS, it's e-com, <laughs> anything else, um, typically you have three different multipliers in that business. You could focus on increasing the number of customers. That's one way to grow that business. There is increasing the average revenue per user, which is what we refer to that in SaaS if it's e-com or any other stuff, maybe it's average order size or different things like that. And then the third multiplier is all about 
churn. So can we reduce that? And so understanding what inputs go into that is really where you're you're placing your bets as a business. And so if you're thinking about, okay, the, the main lever we wanna pull is increasing the number of customers. Now start thinking about what inputs will get us there? Is it launching a new ad campaign? Is it uh, increasing the conversion rates? And that's why um, we just think about this input thinking uh, to get us to those one of those three outputs that we can really do. It clarifies it, simplifies it for us, so we can really focus on what matters. And then the third question was, uh, which inputs should we invest in? And this really just comes down to trying to understand um, which ones will have the biggest impact. So I'm just a good fan of Sean Ellis's ICE framework here in terms of understanding which ones you should invest in or not, but it's really simple. Like just which one will have the biggest impact? Which one are we most confident in that will have that biggest impact? And what is the easiest for us to do? And you can score it up however you want, but what's really important here is that we're prioritizing. We're not just getting a list of inputs and then going crazy and <laughs> going through everything. Um, because at the end of the day, most organizations, especially if you're bootstrapped, there is some degree of resources are limited and there's only so many bets we can take. And so let's make sure they're the ones that count and then we can move our business forward faster to move one of those main multipliers uh, that matter for our business. Got it. And um, you also came up with the multiplier formula and you said, churn is more important than ARPU and which is more important than customers, but there is an anti-pattern uh, by default, we think growth of customers is the, the your attention and your energy goes towards in, increasing the number of customers. So do you want to uh, explain why do you say churn is more important than ARPU and then customers? Yeah, absolutely. And so given the nature of SaaS, if you want to build a business fast, sure, you could get a lot of new MRR coming in every month. That's always a good thing and a good sign of a business that's growing fast. But if you're realizing, okay, we're generating 10,000 new MRR every single month and out the back door is another 9,000 MRR lost, <laughs> like you're going to have to work really, really hard to get to maybe 1 million MRR or MRR or anything like that. Um, so churn is uh, one of those things that it's a leaky bucket syndrome. And so if we don't address this, uh, we're just gonna be pouring more water into this bucket and it's gonna keep leaking. And so that's why churn has to be one of your key priorities always um, to get that down as low as possible. And so um, given product led companies, a lot of them are, are actually targeting SMBs. Um, sometimes churn is actually higher for these businesses, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on it or prioritize it at any degree. Uh, if anything, we should figure out, okay, why are these people churning? And just getting some research on that, I, I've seen so many companies, even the ones I downgrade to or cancel, um, they're not asking any sort of questions around, okay, why did you decide to leave? Why did you decide to cancel? And just even doing that can help you understand how we could prevent this in the future from happening for more customers so that we don't always have to consistently increase the number of customers to get to some MRR goal with a leaky bucket um, because it's just more sustainable to focus on that. Got it. Um, with regards to ARPU, um, most companies who are startups and they are just new and they have one offering, one product, how can they increase their ARPU if they do not know? So ARPU is average revenue per user, right? So for that to happen, you have to sell something and adjacent product. But if they have one product uh, just to offer, uh, they cannot reimagine an adjacent offering. How, how can they increase ARPU in that uh, context? Good question. And so a lot of people think, okay, if we have one increases ARPU, then maybe we have to introduce a new product. But a lot of times that's not the case. If you want to increase your ARPU, we need to think about is how are you charging in the first place? So let's look at Slack since a lot of people are familiar with Slack, although it's an overused example by now. But if you are using the product as an individual user, you start sharing it with your team, um, you're adding more users, which is more revenue in the bank for Slack. 
and more ARPU for every single user and team, or in this case, it's maybe average revenue per account kind of deal. And so if you're looking at other particular products, if you hit that wall or that uh, certain limits, let's say it's 2,000 subscribers or something else, just to keep it simple, you're going to go on to a more expensive plan. And if you hit 10,000, you're going to go on to a more expensive plan. And if you're Stripe, for instance, you are getting a percentage of every sale. And so the best way is how could we help these businesses become more successful? And so that's really the beauty of having value metrics is because as a business, you're just focused on how can we get that person uh, to become more successful of doing that value. And so um, if this is done wrong, which it's easy enough to do, I'll give you an example and I'll share it um, because I recently interviewed one of the, the folks at Unbounce when they did this big pricing rehaul on their pricing page. And so initially, one of their value metrics was they were charging per land, landing page. And so when we thought about it, it was like, OK, that, that makes sense. Unbounce, for those that don't know, is like a landing page uh, software solution. And so they, they make it easy to make landing pages. And so we're like, OK, that on the surface, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, we should charge by landing pages. But it took them a few years to realize that, you know, maybe that's not the right metric. Maybe it's actually conversions. And because that's that's really what keeps people staying here is the more conversions they get, um, the more successful they are within this product itself. And so they changed that. And when you think about how could we get, you know, unbalanced customers to become more successful and really increase that ARPU, um, it's okay, let's align our plans and packaging based on how many conversions you're getting. And so if they're getting 100,000 conversions versus 10 conversions per month, um, we can charge them accordingly because the value exchange there is in line with how we're charging and how we're monetizing our base. And where I see people um, mess up when it comes to ARPU is they might just give it all away based on like a, once they hit a certain amount and they're not actually monetizing based on um, the usage or the value metric. And so um, that's a really great question. I'm happy you mentioned it because it's not easy um, to really understand how that can work for a lot of companies. Thank you. In your book, you also mentioned uh, knowing your ARPU will help you figure out which customers are good fit. Uh, you said not all customers are created equal. Every time you take a bite of revenue, some tastes great, but a good chunk can be harmful. I, I love the writing, by the way. I can read, read again and again. But what do you mean by bad revenue here? Yeah, and so a business can make money in so many different ways, but there is ways where if you're targeting specific customers that just don't get much value out of your product, then why are you biting into that revenue? Because it's just gonna churn out and maybe three to six months and it's gonna ruin all your metrics and it's not the right customer. And so um, typically whenever I see this happening when companies are trying to increase ARPU, but they, they just go in and they uh, find, hey, we just have high churn. Usually it comes down to, they haven't really understood their ideal customer profile and who they should really be helping and what is the main job that they need to get done. And so they're just trying to broaden out and see who's gonna use their product, which is okay if like you're early stage and just trying to see um, who gets the most value from your product. But as you move into a later stage of being a business, it's really important to just narrow down and find, okay, who are the people here that if we target to them, if we got them in and using our product, they're gonna be here for years on end because this is a core fundamental of their business. They need this product. This will help them become successful. They have, yes, the budget and everything else to support this. And it's going to be a product that's gonna be in their stack for a long time. And so if you're targeting customers like that, um, you can even be in the SMB space and have low churn because you're targeting the right kind of customer. Um, but if you're targeting, let's say, um, maybe let's get to an example, like a dance studio, and you are uh, targeting them with an SEO product. Maybe they might do SEO once a year or something like that, or it's a seasonal thing. And so they're not gonna have like this consistent usage. Whereas if you're targeting SaaS companies, an SEO tool, um, they're most likely going to be investing a lot more 
in content and in how they can increase their inbound traffic. And so that's just an example of uh, the, I guess the importance of focusing on the right customer, because yes, you can bite into a lot of types of revenue in your business, um, but let's, let's focus on the tasty type. Got it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've run out of questions, but I just wanted to end with uh, un understanding because you have been scanning the environs and the uh, nature of uh, SaaS businesses all around. What do you see is the success of adoption of product-led uh, growth? Is this, do you see the resistance in the mindset or are there more practical reasons of not uh, adopting? What is the kind of adoption? Is it changing fast or slow? If you could just shed some light on how um, the, the industry is reacting. Yeah, so right now it's still early stage. And I feel like I've been talking about product-led growth forever now, but <laughs> to be fair, like you mentioned earlier, there's still a lot of people that don't understand what product-led growth is all about. And the reason I'm here and still, you know, I'm talking about product-led growth and enjoying it in the process is because I realized that there is such a, a massive benefit today for businesses to make this big jump to become more product-led. And if we look at even at the beginning of the book, I was mentioning some tidal waves that are going to hit every SaaS company, even product-led companies. Um, one of them is the fact that technology it's deflationary. So this is something that will never change. It's something you can bank on, even as an investor, even as you know, just a consumer, you can bank on paying less for your tech this well next year than you can this year. And so it's just like internet's getting cheaper. If we think of even hard drives, like it used to cost so much for a terabyte of information. Now, at least in Canada, like it's less than $100. Like this is very affordable to get a terabyte of hard drive space. Um, and when it comes to SaaS and technology companies, we're expecting more for less. And so the customer willingness to pay has actually gone down 30% in the last five years. And it's gone down a lot more since then. And so we're thinking that if we're just providing the same product, people want this for a hell of a lot less next year. And so if you're not monitoring your customer acquisition costs and how you're really getting people into your product in the first place, um, it's really important for you to think about that because if customer acquisition costs are rising, customer willingness to pay is going down, uh, you don't have to be a finance ways to realize that that just means you're going to be running an unprofitable business if you don't change anything. And so I really do feel like for anyone listening, like if you're still on the fence with sales led, um, even by that point, I would hope you're thinking about the fact that, well, be, being product led is a way to definitely lower your customer acquisition costs, provide a lot more value to people for less because you're not adding a ton of expensive manual qualification with sales throughout that process and you can run a more capital efficient business at the end of the day. And so um, I think there's a lot of benefits, but obviously I'm biased. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so we, we badly scrap, scraped the book. Uh, there's a ton of uh, more uh, information and knowledge in the book. And if you're running a SaaS business um, or if you're a product manager, if, you're, uh, if you make decisions that lead to product modeling and, and pricing and stuff like that, you must uh, go and read this book. As I said, I'm, there's no exaggeration there. I'm, I'm not being paid to promote the book. I'm just mighty fascinated by by, by the impact the book had on me. So yeah, uh, with that, uh, this brings us to the end of this fascinating conversation, Vesh. Thank you again, Vesh, for your time and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us and our audience. No worries. Thanks for having me. This was a blast. Excellent. See you then, Vesh. Bye-bye.